Cool. So um, I'm not going to strictly stick to these slides, um, but I'll use them as kind of a structure or framework to give a brief overview of uh, TSPO imaging. Um, so kind of the first thing to understand um, with TSPO is kind of why why this is you know a relevant target. Why do we care? And really, this all started out of you know the desire of the field to image uh, microglia, which are the brain's primary immune cells. And um, so, with microglia, the I think uh, a key thing to understand is that they're really really dynamic cells, and so they can change a lot depending on um, the different environments that they're in. Typically, they have these fine branches uh, that actively survey the environment for signs or, of damage or infection. And then, if they detect these um, these signs or different cytokines, then they become activated, um, transform in shape, release uh, signaling proteins like cytokines and chemokines. Um, and there's also different flavors of activation, um, which I think is relevant and we'll retouch it at the end. There's a more pro-inflammatory flavor versus anti-inflammatory, although strictly speaking, I would say that generally they're not regarded as binary, but rather some on some sort of continuum. Um, so the key thing to note about activation is that um, when you get these neuroimmune responses to a stimulus, this is actually like a really normal part of healthy brain function that's good because your your body and your brain specifically are responding well to the to the uh, stimulus. But if the process then becomes repeated too frequently or becomes prolonged, that's when you might really start to have kind of um, so, so some uh, problematic results. Um, so this is a cartoon that Jake really graciously sent to me um, that shows uh, a bunch of different imaging targets that we can have to image the immune system. And I, I spoke briefly on microglia, but of course there's also astrocytes, which are which are increasingly um, you know there, there's a there's a very rapidly growing literature on the relevance of astrocytes as well and their importance um, to different immune signaling um, processes. Um, but regarding TSPO specifically, so TSPO is um, expressed in microglia primarily, but there's also expression, expression in astrocytes and endothelial cells. And of course this, um, and there's even some evidence that there's low expression of TSPO in neurons. And so uh, this multicellular ex um, expression of TSPO is really the source of a lot of, um, I would say, um, disagreement in the current literature as to what a TSPO signal means. And then, as I'll get into later, there's also it's also quite complicated to uh, quantify properly. So um, just coming back to this slide, there's TSPO, and I'll just take a quick second to highlight other kind of um, kind of new um, hot areas for different radio tracer development. So um, in addition to TSPO on astrocytes, there's uh, cyclooxygenase two or COX two, um, sphingosine one phosphate one receptors or S1P1R. Uh, the pyrogene 2x7 receptor, which is that's more of like a pharma. There's a lot of um, interest in the pharma world to use that for um, for uh, uh, to target neuroimmune um, to different neuroimmune processes. And then um, there's also uh, reactive reactive oxygen species, and so this is actually imaging um, uh, uh, the, more of the results of inflammation. So this is more directly related to kind of uh, tissue damage that's associated with prolonged immune responses. But all of these, I think the thing to kind of take home and capture with this is that with TSPO, with S1P1R, with COX-2, with COX-1, with any of these tracers, they're gonna provide you one kind of dimension onto kind of the, the status or immune, um, the immune status that they're capturing. And I think that it's really powerful to have multiple of these tools to just give, give us a more comprehensive view of different neuroimmune signaling processes. Um, okay, so um, specifically with TSPO, I mentioned that TSPO is expressed on, um, it's actually expressed on the outer mitochondrial membrane. And as I mentioned, it's expressed primarily in microglia, but it's also expressed in astrocytes and endothelial cells. Um, and then I think it's important to highlight kind of the history of TSPO. Um, and the interest in TSPO as a biomarker actually stemmed from the initial observation in vitro that endotoxin, which is kind of the classic uh, stimulus for, for a robust microglia activation, um, 
TSPO exposure dramatically increases, uh, I'm sorry, endotoxin exposure dramatically increases TSPO levels. And so, um, you know, while we can say, and and as I'll show a little bit of data la later, this expression of TS, this increase in TSPO expression in response to um, endotoxin, I think is, is, is a really key take home. Um, and with that in context, I think it's, I think that we can say that, you know, interpreting TSPO signal at baseline is really complex. It's really hard to say what cells it's coming from, but we can certainly say that TSPO is a marker that's sensitive to the acute activation of microglia as um, indicated by these endotoxin data. So now um, getting into some of the kind of quantification is um, the specific pet radio tracers that we have. Have. There's actually three different generations of radio tracers for TSPO right now. Um, the first was PK-11195. Uh, PK-11195 doesn't really have a lot of specific binding. And so that, um, because of that, it's it's really, um, you know, fallen out of favor. You still see some publications of old data with it. But but the specific binding signal that you get is is not as large. So you're working with a, with a smaller dynamic range if you're doing clinical studies with it. So most radio tracers right now are second generation radio tracers. Uh, PBR28 is is one of the most common, and I would argue one of the best of the second generation. Um, some other good ones include uh, the F18 labeled FEPPA, uh, which is also quite good, uh, quite similar. Um, but with this, it, um, the key thing is that you get increased specific binding and really increased affinity of these radio tracers for the TSPO site. And so when the field graduated from first generation to second generation radio tracers, we noticed something really funny, that there was a small subset of about 10% of people that had zero specific binding. And also there was a really wide range in specific binding. And it turns out, due to some really excellent work that the um, group out of London, uh, Roger Gunn and David, uh, David Owen kind of led this work, they actually discovered that there's a genetic polymorphism that directly affects the affinity uh, for the TSPO site. And it's actually some really cool uh, pharmacology um, because the high affinity binders or people that have two alleles for this, um, for the TSP, um, for the TSPO, they, it, it winds up being a classic two, two site binding curve that you get for the pharmacology of TSPO. And then the medium affinity binders also correspond to the, um, to the heterozygotes. And that corresponds to a one site, one site binding curve of the affinity for TSPO. And then the, the null binders Basically, we don't have any specific binding. Um, so what that means for us practically is that uh, we have to prospectively genotype uh, study participants for all of this. And then, of course, uh, low affinity binders are excluded because they would be getting the radiation for no reason. So that's a really important consideration. And then we have to um, account for this in our statistical models. Um, some people argue that this is a dramatic limitation to account for um, for uh, the um, genotype effect, but it's really just you're losing one degree of freedom in your statistics, uh, which is which is does affect it, but it's not a huge deal at the end of the game as long as you're doing it, making the measurements correctly. Um, so uh, that I think describes kind of the polymorphism polymorphism effect. Um, I'm going to skip some of these slides. I just want to highlight one way we've been kind of using TSPO now. Um, uh, in a way that we think provides still a um, a really nice interpretation that is that kind of rises above this this mixed effect of um, of uh, which the cellular source of the TSPO signal and that is actually giving LPS to either animals or even people now we're doing human studies of TSPO before and after an endotoxin challenge and so we've shown it um, that that endotoxin causes a really robust increase in, um, in TSPO availability. So these data that I'm showing are data from a baboon, where there was about a 30% increase in TSPO um, one hour after the LPS injection that increased to 60% after four hours. And then there was corresponding immunohistochemistry showing co-localization of um, TSPO with activated microglia. And we've also translated this into people um, and we're using this for a variety of different applications now. And this provides us with a measure of kind of the brain's immune response that we do think is still probably localized to microglia. Um, that's supported by this really excellent um, ex vitro work, which 
injected, um, which injected a radio tracer and then used um, cell sorting techniques with the radio tracer on board to identify the cellular sources of change um, after different challenges. Um, this was from a lab in Switzerland, and they demonstrated that in the context of a TSPO challenge in rodents, that the increase in activity that you have is corresponds completely to microglia that's shown in cells, I'm sorry, boxes C and E here. Um, so it gives us some confidence that at least in this context, we're looking, we are indeed looking at microglial activation. And in fact, it's actually probably not microglial activation. It's actually, it appears to be an increase in the number of microglia cells. So a more um, nuanced understanding is that we might actually be looking at an increase in um, the number of cell microglia expressing TSPO. So microglia proliferation might actually be a better way to describe the um, increase in signal that we see rather than microglia activation. Um, okay, so um, I'm gonna just wrap up here and then pass it to Jake by talking a little bit about uh, the quantification of TSPO. Um, so this describes the standard one tissue compartment model that we use. I'm gonna skip past this and go to the two tissue model. Um, there's, um, so in the two tissue model here, you have um, radio tracer in the arterial plasma that's shown in the red box. You have a uh, radio tracer concentration in this um, non-displaceable compartment that that includes both free and not specifically bound radio tracer. And the rate constants are K1 from the plasma to the non-displaceable and then K2 back out. Um, you also then have specific binding uh, compartment with K3 and K4 being the respective on and off rates. Um, and so to, to kind of distill all of this into a nutshell, uh, we you can pretty easily actually write these differential equations just driving the transfer of radio tracer from these different compartments. Um, and then our outcome measure is actually V2, which is the equilibrium ratio of radio tracer in the tissue to that of the plasma. If you solve these differential questions for zero and then work it out, you get the relationship here that V2 is equal to K1 over K2 times one plus K3 over K4. And then to get to the, the parameter estimates, we uh, minimize the residual sum of squares between uh, the observed PET signal and then um, and then the um, the uh, fitted PET signal and find the parameter st set that, that minimizes that outcome measure. So um, this is the typical model that, that's commonly used for a lot. There's been a lot, um, there have been some groups that have advocated for um, expression of the endothelial expression cause it, um, of TSPO uh, arises the need to have a further vascular compartment that then gets that gets described here, and you can add these different differential equations to fit it. Um, we've done the analyses both way with both the full two tissue model as well as the two tissue model with the one extra um, compartment for um, irre irreversible uptake. And the take home is that we actually, um, using statistical methods, we actually identify that the simpler model is more statistically valid. I'm just, you know, really kind of uh, skipping over a lot there, but that's that's the simple take home from our perspective. Um, certainly, I think that the techniques of different sites that vary a lot in terms of quantifying the input function may very well affect how well one site uh, decides which model is better in their data versus the other. So that's another um, consideration. But the other thing is that at the end of the day, uh, you know, measuring VT still is the ideal um, outcome measure. Um, the other thing I'll highlight, I don't have a slide for this, but um, a lot of groups are using um, standard, standard, standardized uptake values uh, relative to either some reference region or um, to whole brain. And so um, if you have a well-validated reference region, and I think a really nice example of this is some of the work that Bill Kreisel at Columbia has done of TSPO in the context of Alzheimer's, they've shown that the VT values in the cerebellum and controls and age match, um, I'm sorry, MCI and age match controls are comparable. And so this, and of course, in the context of Alzheimer's disease, the cerebellum is considered a relatively spared brain region. So in that context, it's reasonable to use the cerebellum as a reference, but um, using whole brain uh, pulls in a lot of um, nuances there with um, interpreting what the outcome is. So if you have a whole brain effect, which we have observed in the case of, for example, alcohol use disorder in, in our team, um, if you use SUVR, because we detect a full, um, a, a whole brain effect, if you normalize the whole brain, you actually see no group differences. So SUVR normalized to whole brain really should only be used in the context of 
uh, very specific hypotheses about very focal uh, increases um, that are uh, kind of the same throughout the study population. Um, so uh, yeah, with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, well, first, I guess, answer any questions, but then we can um, hand it over to Jake and discuss the specific journal articles. So just to just to reiterate, though, because I'll I'll even though we are going to focus on TSPO literature, and um, you did talk about the SNP and how we can exclude the the low affinity binders, which I'll get into in the summary. Um, there there is agreement though that the TSPO signal is what we would consider nonspecific in that it is not just it is not unique to inflammation alone, but it can be is, expressed by um, neurons who or excreting neurotrophic factors or looking for something else to do. It is not a necessarily a, a, a neuroinflammatory distress signal by the neurons. Yeah, I, I think that is a, that's a really important take home that TSPO is, does not equal neuroinflammation, like higher levels of TSPO does not equal neuroinflammation. And in fact, there've been a number of studies that have shown lower levels of TSPO um, compared to controls. And that actually might indicate a loss of you know, a loss of microglia, which is still problematic. Um, but again, the literature is very mixed. There's a lot of very mixed kind of almost wherever you look. Um, so, and there's a lot of different um, strong opinions about what that means in the field too. I was intrigued by the, the, the genetic SNP findings and the fact that that sort of can potentially help a lot with parsing data. When did that come into being? I wasn't sure when the chronology of that was. Is there like a before that and an after that in the literature that? Yeah, so really it really was. Um, so I think it does go hand in hand with the um, development of the second generation radio tracers. Because as I mentioned, the the affinity of PK11195, which is really the first generation, the affinity wasn't high enough to detect the difference in specific binding. You know, it's there in those, in, in those studies, but just the dynamic range that you have is is not large enough with with that radio tracer is not large enough to detect those differences and i think it's it's one very compelling reason why that's not a good tracer anymore <laughs> um so when um this is really bob ennis's group that um they developed the you know pbr 28 is really the kind of the first of the second generation radio tracers and you can see i think they have some 2008 this might be the earliest paper where they have some they just say, you know, we have some uptakes where we see an empty brain and we have no idea what this means. Um, and then um, the, the London group was really able to, to do the really, really cool work, frankly. And I think that was 2010, 2011, when it was kind of worked out kind of what the pharmacology of that meant. And I, I think it is also a demonstration of these that these second generation radio tracers are such a big improvement over the first generation. That was that was great, Ansel. Uh, so I guess I will now try to um, share my screen. Great. Do we see me in presenter mode, or do we see my um, slides in? Just go slide view. Go oh. slide view. Let's see. Let's try. We see. How about now? Yeah, that's a script presenter view. Yeah. There we go. Okay, great. So thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction, Ansel. Um, we were in Kahoot, so it prevented Ansel from from having to uh, create new slides. But unfortunately, I had to make a lot of new slides to uh, uh, to get through a lot of material. Again, um, to give credit where credit is due, this is a slide Bob shared with me in preparation for our latest pay stage, just showing the different possible pet targets and ones that were interested in um, in showing inflammation and how inflammation is a multifactorial uh, process in the cell. And, um, and so now I'm going to try to jump into literature now. Um, what I discovered in reviewing all these studies uh, is that, um, in fact, uh, there are seven studies, not six, as I alluded to initially. And the first study that we didn't send out, NROs, that's on me, was actually a Hopkins study in, in 2005. And, and just uh, noting that 2008 is the uh, the time of the the t well, TOS, the time of SNP discovery, and so I think that's important. So I, I try to create a couple of these tables comparing um, uh, just these 
the studies and, and um, you know where they were where they were done and where they were published. And you see they're mostly uh, published in journals that are, are interested in, in HIV uh, and, and AIDS, uh, with the neurology probably being the, the highest impactor, impact factor uh, here. Uh, let's see, let me get to my next slide. And of course, I discovered at the end of the last paper that there is, they put a table in there comparing uh, the, the different, but that didn't stop me from making my own tables, of course, uh, because I think there are some factors in here that, that needed to be compared that this group um, is particularly interested in, but uh, I think one thing to, to look at is just that they go through here the the, the participant breakdown and the size, um, uh, the, going back and forth. Like uh, this is the Boansa study, the most recent paper, 2020, kind of showing their their largest group and um, uh, things. Different things have had happened, or actually over the years, where in fact there um, one of the the disorders of cognition, uh, HIV associated dementia, uh, got kind of re rebranded. Uh, into HIV uh, associated neurocognitive disorder. So went from had to hand uh, during during this besides discovering the SNP um, kind of this little, this little uh, uh, history of medicine. Uh, but in, in terms of also uh, giving it both the focal understanding uh, that we want to give how we how we dissect PET studies, but also the broader context of what's been going on in uh, HIV and, and, and medications, um, as Anna Rose put in her advertisement, to, to, to help us focus, understand like why that might be um, why that might be important for our study in understanding uh, inflammation. Um, uh, and so, um, uh, and, and, and some of these also go through with their findings. But we'll go through their findings a little bit more later. And of course, you know what I try to put today is is together just the kind of. A, a structure for us to, to, to latch on to certain issues we may think or may not think are important in this um, uh, in this in this moving target uh, of literature, which is although a small percent of the population, very interesting to us and to NIDA for for a number of reasons. Um, and and uh, one other row to, to to just look at is the uh, people living with HIV/AIDS, the cognitive status, and where um, they're looking at also who's impaired, who's unimpaired, and and, and how that's being viewed. Um, there. Uh, let me put my next slide because I have to click. Okay, so one of the first slides I put up to, to re-show, um, uh, you know, what how it was conducted, you know, um, me as the authorized user and how I'm going to do these studies, uh, you know, what they put in, you know, anything from the most recent study, they didn't report how much activity they, they gave um, and what instrument they, they used and some Journals did not want them to use or did not specify, and then which quantification model they um, at least they stated that they used in the study. A lot of them like the uh, Lamursta uh, tissue reference model, um, uh, as uh, as uh, Ansel alluded to at the end, uh, uh, reference region, um, and so the the ANSYS uh, study, the most recent one, used the cerebellar cortex and an unsegmented. Uh, white matter as well, the total gray matter to look at um, SUVRs uh, and, and chose a different part. But I, I would say um, not all of them used actually a uh, an arterial input function, and um, you know it goes back and forth. That is the gold standard, and, and I'm wondering if some of the results or lack of results we see sometimes the gold standard. So I want to put this table together to kind of just show that there is a significant amount of uh, heterogeneity uh, between the different protocols and approaches to how actually. Um, uptake is, is quantified, and certainly there are, are greater experts than me in terms of going through how how these are, are done. And I think um, the the introduction that Ansel gave in, in talking about why the two tissue compartment model looked like the best for um, I think that was PBR 28 you were showing, uh, and and that's kind of what we're we're leaning to at both our institutions uh, for for the pace. Uh, moving on, okay. So and then I also wanted to go through. So the, besides the findings, the two things I wanted to go through today um, that I kind of expanded on are uh, the medications and the uh, polymorphism. Uh, beginning with the medications, and uh, I'll, I'll I put exactly the text that they use for each of the medications. And uh, for example, in, in in the 2006 Wiley paper, they didn't mention medications, uh, although uh, most of the, one thing that's uh, that's because the the prior name. Uh, of the TSPO receptor is the PBR, peripheral benzodiazepine receptor. So uh, benzodiazepines uh, presumably bind to it, and so that was an important drug to exclude 
uh, to not get a confounding effect, as we do in a lot of our clinical studies. Uh, we don't want to occupy the receptors and then try to image them. We we'll, won't have enough mass and enough available receptors. Um, but th there was, again, a lot of heterogeneity applied, um, and a lot of them were just, you know, stop using anti-inflammatories, uh, don't be, you know, no recreational drugs, but, um, but, but kind of a, 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 large, uh, a large spectrum of, uh, of approaches. I would say maybe um, the 2016 uh, Vera paper neurology was the, was, was the most uh, stringent, which they didn't want any neurologic or psychiatric disease, which as we continue to find is, um, it, you know, there's a lot of comorbidities with uh, HIV positive patients and, and definitely neuropsychiatric disease is one of them. So that was definitely probably a tougher uh, uh, population to recruit. Uh, just noticing again, also, um, I broke it down to the uh, <clears throat> the high affinity binding, the mixed affinity binding, and the low affinity binding, and kind of the different approaches. And um, the first two papers, which were the pre-SNP, did not uh, really talk about that. Uh, those who were using the first generation uh, ligands, but moving on, um, I believe that's uh, the Coughlin paper, which is uh, this is the same Coughlin, uh, Jen Coughlin, who spoke to us earlier and gave a, a seminar on behalf of our division and the PACE uh, on neuroinflammation. So they did use that approach. And she's also the senior author on the 2018 uh, Rubin paper. And so that was something that was done. So basically, uh, the, the most of the time, they, we try to exclude the loaded affinity binders, uh, but sometimes, uh, and then look at what the effect is on, on binding. And that was a, a kind of a common, uh, more common approach, at least with these seven um, manuscripts. Okay, moving on. Jake, Jake, let yeah. me just uh, interrupt you with a question. Yeah, when sure. you say you try to um, exclude the low affinity binders, are you yeah. talking about the heterozygotes and the null homozygotes? No, uh, I would just call the null homozygotes. That's the ones they, okay. they, 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 they the, so they don't 10%. bind at all. Yeah, the ones that don't bind at all, the ones that exclude it. The mixed ones do bind. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, but, and, uh, and just but, to, to understand that more fully, uh, yeah. that SNP um, is a non-synonymous substitution, and there's a uh, an amino acid uh, substitution that I think renders it's an the, and a threonine. Yeah, exactly. And the threonine is the null uh, the null allele, and so um, this this suggests to me that there's not uh, a a role for TSPO in the uh, in the uh, pathology per se, but it's really just a marker because I would guess that uh, the genotype does not protect in any way against neuroinflammation or pre result in neuroinflammation. It doesn't directly affect neuroinflammation. It's it's sort of an innocent bystander. Is that correct? I don't think anyone's actually uh, looked at that because basically once that was figured out that those patients don't, at least in this literature, so I'm not sure how it applies. I know um, I've seen the literature, it's not just the TSPO, but it can, the, the, this SNP can kick out other tracers and prevent them from crossing the BBB. I'm trying to remember which so, one. Oh, so, I see. Well, so it's the well, transport, the transport effect. No, 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 Hank, I would, I would generally agree with, with, with the conclusion. I mean, groups do look, of course, at, to see what the, the clinical relevance of whatever, you know, whatever their, you know, uh, disease condition they're, they're examining. Uh, and, and typically there's, there's very little there. And, and, you know, it's thought that TSPO is a cholesterol transporter in the mitochondria, but it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not a hundred percent. Um, yeah, we've, we actually found an association with cholesterol, but that was in about a thousand individuals. So an effect of yeah. genotype on cholesterol levels, peripherally. Yeah, it's it's it, the 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 really. I, I would agree generally. It's probably better thought of as a biomarker than being a functionally relevant. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and and I, but I would also agree that it's. Uh, Hank, that I, I don't think it's, I think it's incompletely explored. And I think the one thing common about you see with all these studies is we have groups of like, I mean, a big group for this study is, uh, experimental group is 12. So we're not going to be able to look at 
you know, and then if it's 10% of that, we're not going to look at its association with a lot of different things. Right. We just but, don't but what, what one could do is using that SNP in a biobank um, is to do a FIWAS, meaning look at the phenotypes associated with that uh, non synonymous substitution. And Which I, is not I, hard to do. It's uh, no. I think I think there was an association with with some disease that I I feel like I ran across that too. Okay. In, in um, all right. Well, well, we could. I didn't anticipate your that, question, so I didn't file it. I'm so I'm sorry. I'll I'll go back and yeah. find it. I did I did run into that. Okay. Um, cool. So uh, one of the things that we we don't that that my practice doesn't you know I don't deal with a lot. And I I dealt with very peripherally during my internship. Um, uh, is the antiretroviral uh, therapies uh, for for uh, HIV, uh, and the one thing that, uh, and just reviewing a lot of some of the NIH sites that I thought was very interesting, and in, in why, um, and uh, in, in why the neurocognitive disorders are very interesting, is because uh, many of them, if not, I think all of them, they said don't cross the BBB. So even though you're used, so the, giving the the central nervous system uh, is a great place for HIV to potentially hide. Um, and, and that's why getting their counts down is, is so important, and that's why perhaps measuring neuroinflammation is so important in this population, um, in, in a way. So these are the different uh, uh, these are the different um, kind of therapies. Uh, I, I don't have enough background, enough personal knowledge to give you kind of the the uh, the evolution of these drugs over time. However, I will tell you this: that 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 is something I've said before is that when in my now, history of medicine, uh, learning medicine, is that I discovered that a lot of infectious disease doctors became uh, experts in the 90s uh, in managing um, hypercholesterolemia and uh, coronary artery disease and blood pressure, optimizing blood pressure medications because patients who are on these drugs long term uh, end up getting, uh, they end up, it ends up, they end up modulating their cholesterol. And um, and in fact, uh, almost inducing a metabolic syndrome in, in some ways. Um, I think it's interesting that the comment that that um, I was unaware of the comment that Corinne made just now about cholesterol um, levels and, and TSPO because I, I don't think we have a you know big enough uh, again no big enough sample size. Um, next slide. So one thing I just to, just to show you that. Uh, how they've done that is different. These are more recent articles, but basically, when you're when you're getting um, uh, when you're getting LDL and diabetes and hypertension in uh, HIV positive patients treated with these drugs successfully in sub-Saharan Africa in pediatric patients in sub-Saharan Africa, you know it's got to be the drug. Uh, it's not the um, they don't have access to the same uh, diet and lifestyle choices that we do in the Western Hemisphere that. That cause such an in increase in, in these in these risk factors. So, uh, unfortunately, these drugs do have a a um, a a a, uh, a predilection to cause these, and it, it's it's the mechanism is not completely elucidated. I will say that for many of the, uh, if you look at the contraindication for many of the retroviral drugs that I shared previously, liver disease, uh, hepatitis B and C, which can obviously occur with HIV, are often um, uh, strong contra uh, contra indicators for using these drugs. So I think the liver plays a strong role in in uh, in, in how these drugs modulate their effects. Um, moving forward, and and this is a direct um, uh, big thank you to uh, to Hank who uh, reached out to Dennis Colson, UPenn Neurology, to to get uh, a list of the different drugs. So for managing uh, cholesterol and blood pressure. Um, that uh, and how they uh, behave with the blood brain barrier, and so what we need to start looking for. And I, I will say that if you go back and look, just big, going back to those those seven uh, studies that, that they did not focus on uh, which drugs and, and and using and excluding which drugs they were they were uh, except I would say that as I mentioned before the neurology uh, journal where they just excluded the the neuropsychiatric uh, uh, patients. Um, and their potential neuromodulation is we found that SSRIs and, and different drugs, uh, the different classes can have anti-inflammatory um, uh, effects. So being that, this, this is the statins, and so you can see some cross and some don't, and so we're trying to focus um, our patients uh, on those that, that don't. 
um, uh, the uh, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, also a mainstay of managing high blood pressure in the renin angiotensin uh, system coming from uh, our gold lat model of renal hypertension. And we don't need to go to history of science of that, but we can, can jump in there at some point if anyone <laughs> wants to, but uh, how that the system was discovered. So the ACE uh, inhibitors are some, and uh, the ARBs are another. Uh, I myself enjoy my 93 cents of lisinopril uh, every month. Uh, and, and it's highly effective. Um, and, and but these are these are drugs, and so we have to choose carefully which ones uh, cross and which one don't cross. So I think it was very helpful to, to uh, for for Hank to reach out to Dennis and us to to kind of look at that more carefully, because I think um, you know when we get back uh, looking at the literature um, and just going through the findings, I think um, I think you'll you'll it becomes to me as I've gone through these. These um, these papers kind of serially that uh, being careful um, you kind of can see the pattern there that there there as you might expect to be more neuroinflammation there is more neuroinflammation but um, it, it happens it's how you set up your experiment so uh, what I did was again in in, in a chronological order I I, um, I have put the find the main findings of each of these studies the, the their words not mine uh, I've color coded them. Uh, in that um, I would say uh, blue are the negative findings, green are kind of the, the weaker but modest findings, and, and I would say that the, the orange uh, yellow is more the, the stronger findings, particularly in, in, the, um, in the Vera neurology paper, uh, they perhaps, uh, every, every, uh, every study did a certain, uh, or, or most studies did a battery of neuropsychological testing all a little bit different uh, but they found the strongest uh, ratios, uh, the strongest relationships rather between uh, different neurocognitive dysfunction um, and uh, and even um, uh, 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 RNA um, HIV RNA concentration uh, in in blood in peripheral blood. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, and in uh, in for example in the in the um, in the in the Garvey 2004, the AIDS, they did not, um, uh, they have some, some modest findings there, but I, I felt like they did not even, I don't think they corrected for the, the uh, TSPO SNP, even though they're after when that was acknowledged. But um, being that they're publishing in this journal AIDS, the, the person, uh, the, the reviewers may not have uh, acknowledged that as a, a shortcoming of the manuscript at that time. Uh, just because more transition or the familiarity with the technique was not was not uh, as as true. Yeah, that, Someone, that 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 study has PK triple one nine five in it, so you actually don't need. Oh, that that, that is that's the first generation. Sorry, that's probably why. Right, that's that's the original, that's the OG yeah. of. Uh, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So, but I felt like that though those results weren't the, weren't the uh, weren't the strongest. Meanwhile, I think the. Hopkins seems to use the DPA 713. I think that that's a considered a second generation, um, as as well as the the PBR 28. So uh, different ligands, different relationships. Okay, one second, backwards. Okay, so I just wanted to run through some of the findings of the study. So uh, just by taking the figures out. So the first study, the Hamoud 2005 study, um, where they did find a, uh, a a week, and this is the controls versus uh, these are different regions. Brain regions, and this is uh, they hypothesize less binding would be more inflammation, uh, and the HIV uh, normal cognitive versus the this is the um, as I mentioned the HIV associated dementia a little bit uh, stronger. So they thought that was there in the in the second paper they did not find a uh, difference, but again PK1195 uh, no differences in washout in in different regions they looked at and they gave these three regions as examples. Uh, I don't know why I have to click this was my favorite figure of um, uh, in all seven papers uh, from Jen Coughlin's group because I think it really now there's nothing that's on the um, the x-axis are just different regions I think they're just plotted differently so you can see the distribution so there's nothing you can see my mouse there's no difference between here and here it's just so they're not all stacked up on each other and I think you see that in in your uh, control and your HIV that you have some that are increasing, some that are decreased. So there is a little bit um, uh, there's a little bit of separation, but it's hard to pull these apart. Um, your alanine, uh, actually, it's an alanine for threonine. 
uh, substitution. I, I think we, we got that backwards when we were talking about it before. Alanine is, is, the, is, the, um, is the normal and the threonine uh, are the, uh, the, the low affinity binders. Yeah, uh, but, just showing that basically, but just showing that basically the, um, the, the low affinity binders, you don't get any signal here, no matter if you're um, uh, control or HIV positive. Um, and then uh, and then it's really tough to discern between some, there are a couple, these two patients that seem to be driving a lot of the, um, the different HIV. But I like this figure just because it, it pulls apart the differences in the groups and the SNP so you get a better feel of what's going on. So I thought this was a, a step forward, um, and I'm glad they published this. Uh, this was the, I'm trying to think, I think this was the Garvey, one, one of the ones, but the, the um, fourth paper, I think this is the Garvey paper. Let me just double check. Yeah, this is the Garvey paper. And what I didn't understand from this paper is they found some significance, but the areas they found were like the cingulate, um, you know, I mean, this does area for, for focal uh, group change in, in the corpus callosum and this, these small areas, the figures didn't really strongly suggest you have these large changes in, 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 in neuroinflammation uh, to me. Um, and so I, I didn't quite feel that this was quite compelling. Uh, this is from the, the, the Vera uh, um, neurology paper 2016, which I did think was quite compelling, where they looked at the high affinity binders in HIV, the high affinity binders in controls, and then the mix in both, and they threw out the low affinity binders, and they did, um, and they were looking for significance. So you can really see across different sites where they have a, a change, and this is PBR28 again, the same ligand, the second generation one that we're using here. Um, and so I thought this was this was well done, and I, I, because they showed this data, I thought it, I was pretty comfortable with um, with the with the results they came to. Uh, this was another article from from uh, Hopkins, um, just showing where they only used HIV positive uh, patients with different amounts of uh, neurocognitive dysfunction, and they're just showing here a parametric map, bottom right of the uh, of the high affinity versus the mixed affinity binders, but then th where they did find associations between binding and working memory in their slew of neurocognitive uh, tasks. Um, just looking at about, uh, I think it was 23 patients, something like that. So um, uh, I, I did like this in, the, in terms of they didn't, they showed there's no difference in, 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 the, in, in the VT of these two different SNPs, and at the same time, populations at the same time, they were able to, to tease out some, I mean, some stronger than others, but it does look like there are, there are some, some patterns there with binding and, and, uh, and tasks. And then this is the Bo Ansys uh, paper at the end where they did not use metabolite sampling, they used the cerebellar reference region, and they concluded that there's no difference between HIV uh, controls, uh, age match controls in people living with HIV or AIDS in, in their uh, PBR28 binding. Um, and so I think it's my last slide, yeah. So uh, just going back to the summary here. So I, I, I do feel like the, the, the most rigorously done literature where they're using, uh, although you know, there is some validity for the, the SUVR uh, use of, of, of measuring um, uh, the PET tracer quantification, um, my sense is that the more rigorous are using an input function and doing some really more detailed uh, work, is that there, there is a relationship there which seems implicit in the data. But um, none of these papers, as I, I showed, really did a really rigorous job at excluding those, um, the, the, the drug effect, um, which seems to be, you know, more and more recognized. And so I think it, I think we are, we're on the right track, but it's just, it's a, it's a tough hill to climb because of, um, uh, because of those medications are just, they're just a result of, of the treatment, of the necessary treatment. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to dive in deeper to one of these studies or, or I'm going to put up another one of my comparative slides, but, um, you know, I, I think these are all, these are all good starts, but it seems like no one has been able to really gather a lot of momentum in, in imaging these patients with PET to create a more sustainable way of looking at them in, in, in interventions. Well, once we, uh... We know with certainty that um, that we're getting a sensitive enough signal uh, with FNOS, uh, and we are paying reasonable attention to excluding uh, anyone on medications that are getting into the CNS and having 
anti-inflammatory effects, then we may be able to speak to this. I think it may be even more of an issue for OUD. I think that the if there's an inflammatory effect with HIV, my guess is it's going to be greater in magnitude than anything one would see with OUD. I so I also would, would they be synergistic? The two. Yeah, and that's another quite. Yeah, that's another. And, uh, you know, it, in fact, it could be that they're synergistic, or that it could be that they interact, but in um, it, opposite what what synergism might reveal. It could be that uh, OUD is associated with lower inflammation, in which case HIV and OUD would not show differences from controls. I mean, that's why we're doing the experiment, obviously. Right, right. Because the, the answer will be interesting. The question I had, I mean, and maybe Ansel, I don't mean to put you on the spot, is that I, you guys aren't at Yale thinking of going away from arterial metabolite sampling anytime soon. You're 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 not going to start using a reference region because it's more convenient. My sense is you're going to continue with with using your arterial sampling. Yep. Yeah. No. I mean, that really is the gold standard for this radio tracer and. As I mentioned before, if you want to, if if the, if it is a whole brain effect, which I think it's not unreasonable to think that it might be a whole brain effect in many cases, then there you particularly need the input function to really be able to to detect that. Um, there's really, um, you know, the input function is really affected by by a lot of things, and it it, it really affects also how you um, what the radio tracer concentrations in brain are, obviously. What, why would it not be a whole brain effect? Um, I mean, HIV is not sequestered in any particular, not to my knowledge, I, I, anyway. Yep, I, I agree. I mean, in the context of HIV, sure. In, in the context of other conditions, maybe not. You know, right, like and, and microglial like distribution. Um, I, don't, I, I assume that microglial distribution is relatively homogenous throughout the brain, but I don't know. Yeah. No, that's that that's some some gray matter versus white matter differences. Not, not well, I mean, your cerebellum only has three, unlike your cortex, which has six layers. Your cerebellum has three layers, logical layers, and so it's got to be there's got to be a little bit different distribution there of where the glia are and how yeah. how they're. But that's obviously a factor if we're measuring TSPO. Right. Less of a factor, I, say, I think, with FNOS. One thing you did you did remind me of is um, there's actually I think there's a TSPO epilepsy study out there where they did show unilateral um, hippocampal uh, uh, TSPO retention slash binding in patients to the ipsilateral hippocampal uh, side that is thought to be responsible for the, the epileptic seizure. So um, yes, this we in this disease it can be a whole brain effect, but I agree it can be also a localized effect depending on what disease you're examining. There's certainly, um, we're not always going to get a universal uh, distribution. By the way, I just want to say this is, you know, quite an extraordinary overview, and I'm really grateful that you guys took it on. I also just had a curiosity, and not based on any specific knowledge, but is there any whiff of heterogeneity that would suggest genetic, you know, modulation in FNUS binding? You know, not that, not that I'm aware of, not that we've seen. I mean, I suspect. I don't know exactly how you know how that was. I mean, I assume it was when things looked like they were really spread, so that you had some people who looked like they weren't binding and some who didn't, and then a genetic piece was suspected. So I, I haven't really looked at the spread of, of uh, responders versus non-responders with FNOS to see if there's anything that looks, you know, trimodalish or bimodalish or whatever. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, when I look at those images, and, uh, you know, I don't think we've seen, and certainly, uh, you know, once once they start, stop, once they have a chance to fully process them at Yale, if they have differences in their, their, their at least their input function from um, from an imaging standpoint, the one, like, the way, as I remember, as, as Ansel kind of alluded to, this was discovered is that at, 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 I think, Imperial College, and Roger Gunn and their group, they were using the second generation, and they had a Couple of people that got zero binding in their brains. Like, how are we getting zero binding of this tracer? That was, in, in, yeah. In the brain. It was, but Bob, while well, Bob Ennis's group was the one. Oh, Bob, Bob, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, they, they had they had empty brains basically, and 
So what, what is going on here? Yeah. It's, it's really interesting to read some of those initial papers because they are, they see, you can tell they are truly puzzled by it. But, and, you know, if, if I, I think it's because there were null binders is probably the reason we might, yeah. it might have taken us a lot longer to catch on if there were no binders. Well, how about anxiety and depression? Are those factors uh, that play into these dynamics? Well, I, I mean, I, there's a huge literature, of course, about anxiety and depression corresponding to kind of neuroimmune status in the brain. Um, and but then again, if you look at the TSPO literature, as as with anything, you get conflicting results. At least with I am at least familiar with like the depression literature, and that that certainly is the case there. Um, but maybe George, you were saying, is it something that we're monitoring or trying to um, measure yeah. in our group so that we could look at it as a potential covariate or as something for parsing the data on the chance that people who have these disorders that already have had an acknowledged inflammatory signature that basically we would just be able to parse it a little bit. Um, maybe that's what you were thinking. Yeah, th that's correct. It's a, something like that. I mean, we do they're, have. They're excluded as because that state is considered co -found, confounding, you know, so we're they are. Yeah. Yeah. There's an they, have, they haven't been the challenge to recruit, though. That, that has not been. Uh, Fortunately, unfortunately, I don't think uh, concomitant neuropsychiatric problems, they're in there. We do get it occasionally a patient that has to be excluded uh, from that, but uh, that's not that's not usually what the, why we exclude the patients. I just put a reference or a link in the chat to, a, a, I think, an interesting review article on TSPO uh, and whether it's a biomarker or a uh, a involved in the pathophysiology of disease. Gotcha. I haven't read it. I just found it. Yeah, there's 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 a lot out there. I mean, that's that's the thing. Everyone's very into using TSPO, and the question because of the non-specificity, not so much the. I, I, I think you know, it would be it. really interesting to do a to do a FIWAS of that of that SNP. It, it could be done in 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 different samples that we have. Uh, very ready access to, so maybe we'll, we'll try doing that. RS6791, I believe. Yeah, I know. The problem is going to be whether that uh, SNP is actually on on arrays that are used in uh, genome-wide genotyping and or how well it's imputed. I think so we, we'll imputed it, we imputed it from an Illumina array, and it was pretty, oh, yeah. pretty well done. Yeah. Um, but also, I wanted to also ask you, you had a collaboration with a Finnish group as a multi-center PBR28 uh, uh, study where you found, I think, a pretty convincing negative correlation with BMI, correct? So there were only a few obese people, but it was also counterintuitive because you would have expected that higher BMI would lead to more inflammation, but there you found a lower signal. Is that... Yeah, I, I, honestly, I just helped transfer the data. I didn't do a ton of analysis <laughs> of that project, <laughs> to be completely honest with you. Um, you know, I, I think uh, I, it's, it's, I always struggle a little bit with large, I mean, on the one hand, we do want to leverage these multi-site collaborations and, and, uh, and try, try to best characterize the study populations we tend to work with. But, you know, it's also not a prospective study. Um, so, and, and as you said, the distribution of BMI, I think, is not, um, is, is less than ideal, but again, we're working with what we have. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know how to speak to that other, otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, Hank, in those biobanks, is there, um, would there be information available on, on metabolic profiles, including cholesterol levels? Oh, you're muted, Hank. I see your mouth <laughs> moving. I see the, uh, I'm sorry. It depends on the biobank. In uh, the Penn Medicine biobank, yeah, there should be. Um, in the, in the uh, Million Veteran program, there, there should be. Uh, in our Yale Penn sample, uh, there is not. I mean, we, it's mostly a diagnostic interview. Uh, where it, it, that's enriched for substance use disorders. So, so you could, 
do uh, FIWAS in different samples to get different, uh, to a answer different questions. Yeah, so I think that small effect of genotype on cholesterol was only present in people with alcohol use disorder, but it may have just been because alcohol increases cholesterol. So there was a wider spread of cholesterol. Alcohol increases HDL cholesterol, but I guess also L LDLs. And total, yeah, and, yes. and I think LDL. Yeah. Well, great, thank you uh, for a very interesting uh, if not uh, fully resolved presentation of, uh, of the, the literature. I think Hopefully FMAS is gonna be a nice sensitive measure of, of, of neuroinflammation or of inflammation generally. Yeah, and we're very grateful because taking on a seven articles is uh, above and beyond the usual journal club discussion of one, but you, you went for a higher, a higher goal. So we appreciate it. We're all the I hope the sum, I hope the summary is adequate because I didn't get as detail oriented as I'm sure we can go and dissect what's good well, and what's I, bad. In in, in but, zooming through the the articles and the abstracts, I mean, I think picking it out the way that you did, and actually, then I'm always a big fan of color coding. Very helpful. <laughs> yeah, we know. We we know. We're very familiar with it. Yes. <laughs> but it yes. does help from the page, doesn't it? So. Yeah. We, we really do appreciate um, it. And if people do have other questions for you, they know where you are, at least yeah. electronically. And I, and Chris Petro is also kindly uh, recording this so that we actually have it for Sharon and people who might not have been able to come during this hour, but who are thinking about inflammation and neuroinflammation day and night. All right. I, I mean, to me, to me, I think also just every, a lot of these articles are trying to get the same thing, but I, I, there's such even even though there's limited, uh, what I was impressed impressed me was the the heterogeneity between the the, the approaches. Even uh, yeah. despite the fact we're just everyone knows about the neurocognitive disorder. Everyone knows there's you know you're trying to measure viral load. Everyone's at the TSPO signal, but they're just all very different, and their results are all very different. Um, but there are some themes there that they've they've kind of clung in, you know clung onto consistently. And so I think it just it's a little bit it's a little bit harder, but again, we have to kind of keep on at this at this challenging topic, which yeah. we we do think I do think there is something there. Um, hey, Jake? Yeah. It's Bob. You know, Anna yeah. Rose, your your question got me thinking, and it's it it got me thinking along the lines. I, I've never really looked at this before, but I uh I I did a quick Google search for INOS and um, GWAS studies. And apparently there are a couple of polymorphic forms of, a couple of SNPs that actually lead to increased INOS activity. Huh. And is associated with hypertension. At least it might be, a, so, so I mean, I just did a, a, a 30 second Google search. So it, it's something I'll probably spend the rest of the afternoon doing. So um, I, I don't know. Uh, they're yeah, fairly, fairly prominent uh, uh, SNPs. Well, that's very, that's very interesting because it, it was, it sort of just came to mind because obviously everything that we have here with the importance of the SNP for the other tracers. So that would be very interesting. Could be very important if we have small samples to be able to parse them. All. Well, I'll send it on to uh, the clinical and imaging cores, and and I'll <laughs> let you know what I find. But it is interesting, and it, I guess it raises the question is. Is it possible to actually screen our patients for these SNPs? Yeah, of course. We built of that course. into uh, yeah. into the grant. I mean, that's a yeah. no-brainer. Yeah, we can yeah. do that well, easily. Yeah, I, I will. I will see what I can find, and I'll, I'll forward it along. Again, <laughs> I am not an expert on this, um, but I will. Uh, I'll see if you know what what is in the literature on these yeah. uh, these GWAS studies, looking at the INOS and associated with associating it with uh, incidence of disease, okay? That's very Great. cool. All right, well, thanks a lot. And thanks everybody thanks. for stopping by. And we have Take a good care. talk next week too. So uh, next week at three, Stephen Ross. See you all then. Yep. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Bye.